Good morning, everybody. Woo! Glory to God. It's a great day. It's a great day. And for all of you, it's going to be a life-changing day. I believe it. <sighs> Had a tremendous measure of prayer this week. And I didn't understand until I walked in. You know, God doesn't show you everything all the time. He just shows you a little bit. We do just a quick review. I thought there was going to be a whole series that I started last week, but it's a, it was a wonder, a one-hit wonder. Isaiah 55, we're going to do a quick review, though, because it will lead into where I'm going this morning. Isaiah 55, verse 10. A special welcome to anybody who's here for the first time. We're glad you're here. Or if you've been here before but haven't been here for a while, we welcome you as well. Open up your heart to God because he really wants to move in your heart and life. Isaiah 55, verse 10. For as the rain comes down, the snow from heaven... And does not return there, but waters the earth, and breaks it, bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God's word has the power to change and to accomplish and to do whatever God designed for it to do. No word of God, as the angel said to Mary, is void of power. No word of God is void of power. The power, the ability to do or cause whatever God designed for that word, whether written or spoken, to fully come to pass according to what God designed for it to do, that's what's in each word. And then we ask the question, so why do so many get so little or nothing out of the Word of God, even though they hear it, and it has all this power to accomplish, to thrive, and to flourish in people's lives? Why do people get so little out of it? So many are trusting in their head knowledge of the Word of God. Like the Pharisees and Sadducees of Jesus' day, they have much head knowledge of the Word. But like the children of Israel in the wilderness, they neglected to do something extremely important in order for the Word of God to profit them. So last week, we talked about profiting from the Word of God. How many of you want to profit from the Word of God? You're here to hear the Word of God, then you need to profit from it. But the children of Israel made a mistake. God said, I have given this land, the land of Canaan, to the children of Israel. I've given this land. Numbers 13, verse 2. I've given you this land. But then he, he told them to pick out a leader from every tribe. All 12 tribes. And uh, so they were to go and spy out the land. Not to see if they could take the land. Because God said, I've already given you the land. But to go see what kind of land it was. it was, it was meant to be an inspirational tour. Or inspirational patrol, if you will. Okay? And instead, they allowed what they saw, walled cities, giants, armed, and seemingly in the natural strong people, to affect their heart so much that they forgot what God said. I've given you the land, children of Israel. They forgot it. And they brought back an evil report because they said, oh yeah, it's a good land, but you gotta watch out for those bad butts. Amen? Oof, bad butts. There's a good butts. But God, who's rich in mercy, so on and so forth, for his great love wherewith he loved. Those are good buts. But there's bad buts. And those bad buts are when, when people say, I know God said that, but that's a bad but. Amen. 
And so they brought forth an evil report. that The giants in the land, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. We can't take the land. Oh, what are we going to do? And people swallowed that evil report. Now, you have to remember, these are people who saw the miracles of God's deliverance out of the land of Egypt. He's brought water out of a rock. He's brought manna from heaven. He brought, when they complained about having too much banana bread, then he brought, you know, uh, quail so they could have meat. And so, I mean, God has done their, their clothes. They've been walking around the wilderness for a while. Their clothes aren't wearing out. He's healed them from different things. I mean, there was just all kinds of, of, of stuff that God has done. He parted the Red Sea. So they could walk across on dry land. He's done so much, and yet they neglected to do something extremely important. Now in Hebrews 3, 7 through 4, 2, God talks about that they did what to their hearts? They hardened their hearts. So you determine what's in your heart. You determine whether it's clay or wax. When the sun shines on Clay, what does it do? It hardens. If it shines on wax, what does it do? It's, it melts, it softens. And you determine what kind of heart you have. Amen. Now, God was angry because these people had seen so much. And God had done so much for them. And we must guard, the Bible says in those verses, against developing an evil heart of unbelief. You in this church have seen marvelous healing. People have been healed of cancer. People have been healed just about of every kind of malady. But it's easy to allow the routine of life to begin to gnaw away at our confidence in God. Amen. And so there's a parallel for us. They were entering a physical promised land. Promised land is not heaven. It's here on the earth. Our promised land is all that Jesus bought and paid for us through his death, burial, and resurrection. And that's not just forgiveness of sin and the new birth. There's so much more. That's healing, deliverance. That's safety, soundness, wholeness, preservation. All kinds of stuff. That, you know, all the promises of God are yes and amen. So why, why didn't the word of God profit them? Now turn to Hebrews 4. We do need to look at this verse before I go on to my message. Verse 2. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well to them. See, any time the word of God is preached, it's good news. There's the good news of that Jesus has died for us. He's paid the price for our sin. That's good news. But notice they had the gospel preached to them. What was the gospel? I've given you the land. I've given you the land. <laughs> That's good news. Because they were people without a land. He said, I've given you the land. Amen. But, here's one of those bad buts again. But the word they heard did not, everybody say did not. Did not profit them. The word profit means to benefit, to give advantage to. Did not profit them. Why? Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Every time you hear the word, you've got to mix faith with it. For it to profit you, you've got to mix faith with it. See, we, we, we've sat in these traditional Christian churches that where, where you just kind of hear the word and you, you, it, it kind of runs off you like water off a duck's back and you walk out and you're not changed, you're not transformed, you haven't taken it to heart. And there's no difference. We just kind of hear the word, and because we've heard the word, and we know what it says, we think that it's really making a difference in our life. When, folks, it doesn't profit us unless we mix faith with it. It did not profit the children of Israel because they didn't mix faith with it. How do you do that? Remember Romans 10, 8? 
But what does it say? That's the righteousness which is of faith. What does the righteousness of faith say? The word is near us, even in our mouth and in our heart. You've got to put the word of God in your mouth, and you've got to keep it, establish it, and keep it in your heart. Well, they had heard the word, but their mouths betrayed them. First, the ten spies, other than Joshua and Caleb, who didn't, they didn't do that. But the other ten brought forth an evil report. Their mouth betrayed them, and they forgot what was in their heart. God had said, I've given you the land. And so they didn't mix faith with it. And because of that, they died. They said, oh, would we have died? It would have been better if we had just stayed in Egypt. And they got what they said. Their own mouth wrote their own condemnation, their own judgment. And so if we want the word of God to profit us, we've got to put the word in our heart, in our mouth, and mix faith with what we hear. Oh, I wish I could. You can go back and listen. To if you didn't get a chance to hear it, you'll want to go back and listen to the whole thing. I just hit the high points. Now, shifting gears. Everyone here, everyone in the world relies on someone or something, even if it's just their own strength and ability. Did you know that? Everybody relies on something. Mm-hmm. God said to me when I was preparing that it's, that it's time for each person to be honest with their own self about this question. Who are you relying on? Who are you relying on? He also said to me that your reliance can differ from area to area. You can rely on God for your salvation from sin and the new birth, but you can, you can forsake God in other areas. You don't trust him in those areas. Amen. You can rely on God from salvation from sin and look to man for healing and health. Where's your reliance, your trust? The way God has, pre has been presented is which, he, he basically has been presented, you can't really know what God's going to ever do. That is just not the case. There's no room for trust or reliance in such baloney. You know exactly. That's why God gave us his word. So we can know exactly what his will is. We can know exactly what he'll do in any given situation. Talking about what he's promised. Now there are things we have to seek him about because they're not specifically revealed because they're personal to us. Like what's my purpose in this life? What's God asked me to do? What am I going to stand before the Lord Jesus and at the judgment seat of Christ and give account for we got to find that out for ourselves. But, but the things that are revealed, that Jesus bought and paid for, they belong to us. Where's our reliance? Where's our trust? Amen. The, the, this way that God has been presented has fostered a reliance on things other than God. But God says this is not the way things should be. Look at Numbers 23. Numbers, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers 23. Verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken? And will he not make it good? See, that's, that's God. God is a covenant-keeping God. What God said, he meant, and he meant what he said. He will do what he promised. We can rely on it. See, anything else doesn't foster trust. You know, my dad was a good man. I, I pretty much knew where we stood. We, I knew what my dad expected. But you know, my dad wouldn't have been a good dad if I'd never known what he was going to do. One day, 
You know, he wanted me to do chores. The next day, he wanted me to milk the cows. The next day, he wanted me to do something. You know, if, if he never, I mean, if it was just vacillating all around, if there was a set of standards that was always changing. But I knew what my dad expected from me. And so I did it, and I had his favor. And see, that's the thing. We can trust in God because he's straightforward. We know exactly where he's coming from. Amen. It's upon this basis that we can establish unwavering trust. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. It's this kind of basis, this kind of trust that can be fostered because we understand that God said what he meant and meant what he said. Look at Proverbs 3 verse 5. Proverbs 3 verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not some of it, all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. I'll get back to that. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Unless we walk by faith, it is easier to lean on our own understanding. In other words, come to natural conclusions about things. But when we learn to put our total trust in God, look to him for all things, then he directs our paths and we are totally blessed. Amen. Um, I went and forgot to grab, I had a, 26 translation. I was going to read from the Moffat, the New English Bible translation. But basically what it said in the Moffat's translation, it says, why are you looking to human aid? Why are you looking to human aid? Turn to, to um, Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. He shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. Cursed is the man who trusts him. We're cursed if we trust in man. If we look to human aid, if we lean upon the strength of man instead of the strength of God. Oh, are you saying we can't ever look to man? No, you can look to man as God directs. But you look first to God. God's always first. Our first look is at God. We are cursed, ultimately empowered to fail when we put our trust and reliance on human aid. Our number one go-to is, if our number one go-to is man instead of God in this situation, the Bible says we're going to be cursed, empowered to fail. Notice the last part of this verse, whose heart departs from the Lord. Because see, what, what you're doing is, you're looking to man instead of to God, so your heart is divided. You've got to look to God. Single-mindedly, as, as they sang this morning. That's why that song really resonated. Single-mindedly. Not dividedly. Jeremiah is addressing a people who have done just that. They have began to trust in human power and aid. They have began to go their own way and do their own thing. Trusting in their own ability to supply, to live, and protect themselves. It's so easy to begin to think, hey, I've got it. Especially when you're young. <clears throat> the Bible talks about... <coughs> The glory of the young man is their strength. The glory of the young man is their strength. You know, just, whoa. 
I, when, 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 when I, I don't know, I hadn't thought of this in years, but when my brother and I were young, we, we gloried in our strength. And so in the middle of winter, we'd get bored. And so what we'd do is take kitchen chairs and my mom would always say, oh, be careful now. <coughs> and we'd take kitchen chairs and we'd set them like hurdles. And we're only, I was probably five, my brother seven, and we'd come running and jump over those chairs and then land and then you'd take one or two steps and you'd jump over the next chair and you know, and you just like, oh yeah, the sap of life is just flowing, man. You know, after we lost our beloved cat, Max, we got a couple of kittens now. Man, I'll tell you, I forgot how much energy them buggers got. But they just go, go, gophers. This, they're so full of life. So full of life. But it's like Isaiah 40 says, even the young men shall fail and utterly fall. Only those who wait, minister to, trust in the Lord, shall renew their strength. Amen. But these people, the children of Israel at this time, had begun to go their own way. They did not see that they'd become like a shrub in the desert, withered and in great need. They, and like verse 6, the second part says, they shall not see when good comes. They weren't seeing the good coming. They, they miss out on the blessings that God had wanted for them. And the last part of verse 6 is going to get dry and tough. and It'll be like living in a place not fit for human habitation. There's some salt deserts where nothing grows. It's just barren and dry. And when that dust gets in your eyes, it burns. But then notice, I want you to notice, then God contrasts this to the man who puts his trust and reliance upon God. Verse 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. The word blessed means empowered to thrive and flourish. Amen. Amen. Anybody here have the Amplified? What does the Amplified say, Brenda? Yep. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord, is the Lord. He shall be like a tree planted by the waters. Go ahead. Okay. I'll just repeat you. That's all right. It spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear, and will not fear when, heat comes, when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought and will not cease from yielding fruit. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Amen. When so many people we're absolutely drying up and, and just bent out of shape about COVID. We were thriving and flourishing. Amen. Why? Because we're trusting in him. Blessed is the man who trusts in God. Trusts in the Lord. You know, it's like a tree planted by the waters. In dry areas, only where there's groundwater do certain trees grow. Experienced people of the desert look for such trees because it's a sure indication of water. There's also some animals that have to have regular sources of water. And if you see those animals, you know water is close, even though it can be hard to find sometimes. Amen. Hallelujah. So, a person trusting and relying upon God does not have to fear when heat, fiery trials come. Why? Because his leaf, their health and vitality will stay green and vigorous and won't be worried or anxious in the time of drought nor cease from yielding fruit. They're going to retain their job, their business and be blessed. Even if everybody else is not prospering, we're going to prosper. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So, 
I want to talk about some things slash persons we can put our trust and reliance in. Obviously, the Bible says to put our trust and reliance in God, but this is not an exhaustive list, but this is some things that God talked to me about. Number one, and, and we got to talking about this last night at Saturday Night Prayer. Number one, some people trust in the government. <laughs> what was that, Frank? <laughs> I heard him go, oh, I was trusting the government. <laughs> You're exactly right. It is dangerous to look to and become dependent upon government. Why? Hmm? Because if, if evil people get in office, what happens? They start to control you. And what have we experienced? Control. The exercise of the worst kind of control we've ever seen. And you know right now that our uh, usurper president is trying to make us subservient to the World Health Organization when it comes to any kind of pandemics or whatever? That's, I mean, and it would be legally binding. Instead of being autonomous, we would be subject to the World Health Organization. Another way they could control us. It's why our government by our founding fathers was set up the way it was so that government couldn't control because they came where kings ruled with an iron hand. There was no freedoms. And uh, there was all kinds of these controls. And so when the devil puts wicked people in office, they'll strip your freedoms. That is why wicked leaders want to eliminate the middle class in the United States of America. Why? Because we have enough money and time to think for ourselves. In most third world countries, what two classes of people do you have? The very rich and the very poor. And what's the problem with the very poor? They're so busy just trying to survive, they don't have much time to think. And so they stay subservient. And that's what they want here. The, the elitists want to get to the place where it's just the elite and all of us peons. And then we have to do what they say and they can do whatever they want. Do you know this is how Hitler came to power in Germany? Right after World War I, they put these extreme sanctions on Germany because of World War I. Extreme sanctions, probably unreasonable sanctions. Well, the Wehrmacht Republic, which was the government after World War I, they got a loan from the United States. Well, what was the problem with that? We went into the Great Depression. We had to call in that loan, put them in extreme crisis. I mean, unemployment went skyrocketed. People were out of work, were hungry, they didn't know how they were going to feed their family. Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party were not very popular up to this point. But what happened is into this void, the devil was able to insert this very evil man who seemingly seemed to present some ideas that began to put people back to work, began to you know, people aren't hungry anymore. Germany began to get back on their feet. They began to get some national pride again, so on and so forth. So they overlooked some of the evils that they saw in him because of what he was doing. And you know the rest of the story because he, once he got into power, at one point he had enough power where he just got rid of the parliament and declared himself dictator ultimate ruler and uh, <laughs> you know and then afterwards I seen German people that were interviewed after that and said well you know we, we should have said something we should have done something 
but we just were happy to have food and a job and so on and so forth. So they, they compromised. They started looking to a man, looking to a government, even though it was wicked. And uh, look where it ended up. Millions of people died because of it. Number two, the second thing people can trust in is medicine. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not against medicine. I, I thank God for, for doctors, nurses. We've got doctors and nurses in our congregation. Don't get me wrong. All right? But I am against trusting in them above God. Amen. We have been blessed in this country for so many years to have doctors, hospitals, and clinics that always put the good of the patient first. But in my opinion, this is just... Remember now, this is just my opinion. Some of you may agree with me, some of you may disagree. But in my opinion, many doctors, hospitals, and clinics during COVID violated that trust. Okay? For money's sake, many doctors, hospitals, and clinics took money from the government for doing certain things that I believe, in my opinion, did not have the patient's best interest at heart. If God tells me to go to a doctor, and I thank God for Dr. Pete. Hi, Dr. Pete watching me over the, the uh, live streaming. If I go to a doctor, I go to Dr. Pete. I will go. I don't go very often. Maybe three or four times in the last 40 years. But I will only go when God tells me. And then I only do what God tells me to do, not what the doctor says. Because I'm not trusting in the doctor. I'm not, you know, no, I want to hear, because the doctor is trained about medicine, I want to hear their perspective. But I'm going to do what God tells me to do. Be one of the reasons is, folks, you have to realize doctors, because of malpractice suits, are trained now to tell you the worst case scenario. That's true. And if you buy into that, you can actually open the door to the devil to come in and wreak havoc in your health. Amen. So my trust is in God, not in the medical. Medical is only a tool which can, tool which can be used by God. And thank God it is a tool that is used by God to help people. But the person needs to be trusting in God. The third thing that people can trust in is their job or slash business. God gives us jobs or businesses that through which he can cause blessings to flow. Yet, if we begin to trust in, rely upon, and look to that job or business instead of God, we can be cursed instead of blessed. It's all a matter of perspective. If you look to your job or business to supply your needs, what do you do if you lose that job or the business fails? If you're trusting and relying upon God, it'll not move you because it won't be your source. God is. But if the job or business is your source, you'll be devastated and severely tempted to enter into worry. Amen. God gives jobs slash businesses. Keep your trust and reliance in him and then he can work through that job or business. He can give you raises, he can, you know, bring all kinds of customers in, so on and so forth. He can bless what you put your hand to. Number four, the fourth thing you can trust in is relatives slash family. I've seen people do this. I love my relatives and my family. But I'm glad I don't have to trust in them. Mm-hmm. Family slash relatives can be fickle. You think they're totally in your corner, but when the chips are down, they may not be there, especially if your struggles have also affected them. Amen. People have trusted in inheritances, promises from relatives, only to be let down and disappointed. God never lets us down or disappoints. He is our blood covenant, heavenly Father who never fails us. He is always faithful. Hallelujah. So I trust in the, my heavenly family. God, my father, Jesus, my big brother. 
Glory to God. Hallelujah. So watch out. Watch out that you don't put undue trust, a, a, a twisted trust in relatives or family. Number five, people can trust in their own ability. Now this is never much of a temptation for me. I'm not naturally gifted with mechanical ability or understanding. Amen. I'll give you an example. I took a small engines class in college because I thought, well, that might be good for, you know, because at that point I was going into landscaping. So I took a small engine class in college. I really struggled. Man, I'll tell you. Thank God for a fellow classmate who had mechanical ability and understanding who helped me through. We had to tear down, put to back together a small engine. With his help, without his help, I would have never made it. And you know, so much of what I learned in college, I remember. <laughs> and I, I did gain some understanding, but I'll tell you, mechanical things just don't click with me like some other things. I'm not, that's not a bad confession. Okay? I've learned. I, I, I mean, I can listen to my engine most of the time when I take it to the mechanic. If there's something wrong, I can usually tell them what it is because I've learned enough about that. But how to fix it? You know? I mean, sometimes Rich Kimberly. You know, I'll, I'll ask him a question about something, and he said, oh, it's real easy, Pastor. I'm going, yeah, right, bud. Mm-hmm. For you. You who tore down a whole Massey Harris tractor for your father-in-law and then put it all back together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, I mean, you get people like Frank that can, Frank Vadalero can do all kinds of stuff. But that's just not my, I, I marvel at people that have that kind of gifting. Now I have some gifting in understanding the realm of plants and landscaping, but this is one of my few natural skills beyond speaking in front of people. Some people, like Rich Kimberly and Frank and Mike Marshall, they have a wide variety of skills that amaze me to no end. People like that have to guard against looking to themselves because they're good at so many things. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Verse 17. Then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. Because he talks about there. Look here at verse 11. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not, for, not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes that I command you today. Lest when you are eaten and are full, have built beautiful houses, dwell in them. When your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied. When your heart is lifted up, you forget the Lord your God who brought you forth of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness in which were fiery serpents and scorpions, and thirsty land where there was no water, brought water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that it might humble you, it might test you, and might do you good in the end. Then you say in your heart. And folks, this is the United States of America. People have built goodly houses. Our silver and gold is multiplied. All that we have is multiplied. God's brought us through a lot of things. But then there's a temptation to say in our heart, the might and the power and might of my hand has gained me this wealth. I've had people get mad at me. I bring up the principle of tithing. And people get mad at me. And you know what God revealed? I said, God, why are they mad at me? And it's, he said, because they're trusting in themselves. And when you say tithe, is to remember that every good thing comes be, because of God. You just knock their props out. Because they're looking to themselves. Yeah, look what I did. Look at him. I gained all this. Yeah. You wouldn't have anything if God didn't give you breath. You wouldn't have anything if God didn't give you health. Bring it. 
People are opposed to tithing because they have to acknowledge that it is God, not themselves, that's prospered them. Verse 18, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. That he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. And I've had people say to me, well, it's not God who gets up and goes to work in the morning. Well, it's God who gives you the ability to get up in the morning and go to work. Amen. Amen. So, what are you trusting in? Name of my message this morning is, who do you rely on? Who do you rely on? We don't ever want to get to the place where we rely on government. Because then we are vulnerable to have all of our freedom stripped. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Not just in, in you know, lip service, but where he's really God. And we keep his commandments. And we walk with him and we serve him. And we follow him. And make a difference in this life. My wife and I went Friday night and saw the movie Jesus Revolution. Anybody here seen that? It's a good movie. If you haven't seen it yet, you should go see it. It's, it's, it's about what happened in the 1960s and early 70s. Jesus people movement. It was a substantial coming to Jesus time. But folks, we're on the verge of an even greater time. We're seeing the beginning of revivals on like, there's like 20 different campuses, the last I heard anyway, where revival is broken out. That's not the end time outpouring. That's just reviving of the saints, leading us toward what's coming. Because when that, the, the outpouring comes, it's going to be out of this world. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Now, I said that there's some people here that's going to have their life changed. Hallelujah. And uh, I want to ask you, my dear lady, you right here, is there something you need? Hmm? I didn't know. Do you need healing in your body? No, I got bad ears, bad eyes, you know, bad shoulder. Are you ready to be healed? By the power of God? Come up here. Ushers come. Is your hip bothering you too? Oh, my back. It's been your back? Me. My back has been bothering me for years. For years? For years because, the, you know, we have hard jobs. Okay. Yeah. Now, I want you to get your eyes off of me. I'm only the delivery man. But the power of God, when Jesus died for your sins, do you believe he died for your sins? Oh, heaven, yes. He died for your sicknesses as well and your pains. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that he took our infirmities and carried our pains. Okay? So that means if he took them and he carried them, you don't have to. Okay? And so today is your day. When I said I was praying for somebody this week, I was praying for you. I saw in the spirit realm when I walked out here, I didn't know who you were. But I saw in the spirit realm there's two evil spirits that are, are, are oppressing your body. I saw one on this shoulder and one on this shoulder. Oh, my God. Yeah. No, and I didn't say you're of the devil. What I'm saying is the devil's attacking you. Okay? Yeah. One's a spirit of infirmity that's causing the problems in your body, but the other one's concerning your ears. Oh God. Hallelujah. So I'm going to cast those things off of you and then I'm going to release the healing power of God. Okay? And the healing power of God is like electricity. 
That's why I'm going to lay hands on you because uh, uh, your faith will draw that. Now, see, I, I start talking about and the power of God's already in my right hand. Okay? Amen. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Now, I'm going to address those evil spirits, so don't be startled. Right now, now I see you, you sniveling, ugly little thing, oppressing her ears. Come off of her right now in Jesus' name. And you, spirit of infirmity, leave now in Jesus' name. I command healing power from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. Eyes be healed. Ears be opened. Back be healed in Jesus' name. Muscles, tissues, ligaments, tendons, bone, all healed. Come into proper alignment, spine, in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Did I miss anything? Is there anything else you need? All right. Now bend over and touch your toes. Could you even get down that far before? No. No. Glory to God. Been years. Now see, God wants you to begin to put your trust fully in him. And your eyes are going to get better and better and your ears, uh, your hearing is going to get better and better. Glory to God. Just keep thanking him. Just keep thanking him. Just keep thanking him. We love you. We hope you come. Learn the word. Amen. You're welcome here. Amen. Let's lift our hands. Just thank him for a moment. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for ministering to this dear lady. Thank you, Father. Is there anything else that you want to do? Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Tony, I need to lay hands on you for strength. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for supernatural strength in Jesus' name. No, I told you to leave before you, spirit of infirmity. You stay off of him. You have no place here. None. I command healing from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Strength, health, vigor, wholeness in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. 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 Glory be to God forevermore. Thank you, Lord. See, God's got the answers for everything. There's nothing he doesn't have answers for. You know, one of the things that, that God really spoke to me in that Jesus Revolution movie is we, we've got to be ready to shift. Because there's going to be people with tattoos and piercings. Everything. I mean, stuff is going to be hanging out and sticking out and pooching out. And I mean, and we're just going to have to be able to look past that and love them. Okay? I'm saying this so you don't get shocked. Because they're coming. As long as we're willing to accept them where they're at. We're not accepting their sin. But we're accepting them as a person. Because, I mean, you saw, if, if you saw the movie, you saw those religious folk get all uptight because there's hippies in the church. My God, that's where they need to be. Thank God Chuck Smith saw that there was a difference. I mean, his church was going nowhere. He was doing nothing, sticking the mud. 
But the, you know what, what? One of the greatest things just made me, tears come to my eyes. Well, when that older guy starts walking out, and instead he walks over and puts his arms around a couple of hippies and said, Praise the Lord! <laughs> and I go, Yes! And those religious people went, Oh, you just wrinkled up their nose. But see, that's what makes a difference. Thousands of people were reached because somebody was open to God. 100%. Hallelujah. Let's put our trust in him. Amen. Let's pray as we get ready to receive the offering this morning. Father, we thank you for this offering. We thank you that our trust is in you. Thank you, Lord, that you give us ability to go to jobs and do businesses and, and whatever else that you use for sources of income. Father, we just thank you for that strength. It's only because of you that we're able to do that. And so through our tithe, we're acknowledging that you are the one that has given us that strength, the power to get wealth. So we thank you that we can bring our tithes and give offerings above and beyond that tenth. In Jesus' name as you direct. And thank you for directing us now. And everybody agrees with that said? Amen. Amen. If you're making out a check this morning, make it out to Eternity Church or Market EC. If you're giving cash, you want a tax deductible receipt, raise your hand while the ushers give you an envelope. Just keep your hand up until they get to you. You know... The Holy Spirit keeps telling me this. I, I got to tell you this. God is really proud of you. The devil's attacked you in certain areas where, where the devil tries to say, oh, you know, you've done this wrong, you've done that wrong. But God's really proud of you. He looks at your heart. You just keep coming after God because I'll tell you, he's going to bless your socks off. Amen. Hallelujah. If you're making out a check this morning, make it out to Eternity Church or Market EC. If you're giving cash, you want a tax deductible receipt, run a, one of the ushers give you an envelope. Anybody else need an envelope? Did we miss anybody? I can't remember what all I did there. That was coming up in my spirit, and I can't remember if I said that before or not. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, let's all stand then. Present our tithes and offerings to him. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, and our Heavenly Father. Say it out loud. Say, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we bring our tithes and we give our offerings because our trust is in you. We don't trust in ourselves. We don't trust in our own ability. We trust in you. It's you that gives me the power to get wealth. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen.